Hello, my name's Kate Mason. I'm from Australia and it's the 7th of September 2024. Fazans is Australia and New Zealand's food authority. They have a current proposal open for community submissions ending on Tuesday the 10th of September to allow genetically edited food to be grown and sold without any safety testing or labelling. Meaning we, as the consumers, will not know if the food we are eating is genetically edited or not. Fazans asserts that genetically edited food is the same as natural, conventional food, that it has the same characteristics. Under this definition, lab meat would be seen the same as meat, as the lab meat has added synthetic vitamins and minerals which match the natural levels of vitamin and minerals in meat. The public is being asked to go along with a hypothesis that synthetic is the same as natural. It's not. Following I have pulled together various videos and voices of professionals who are raising concerns regarding the Fazan's proposal. I have been endeavouring to understand the new food technologies for a number of years and I hope this video assists people like myself who don't have a genetic or scientific background yet we care deeply about the quality and integrity of the food we eat. Please consider putting in a submission and raising awareness about this imminent threat to our food systems. We're at a very crisis time. As I say, the Fazan's decision or, or proposal deadline next week, we're not talking about let's have a debate and let's listen to the to the, the proposals to regulate gene, gene, genetic engineering and release it in the environment in New Zealand over the next six months with, through, a, through a select committee process. This is happening now. It's largely behind closed doors until now. The paradigm shift that's been announced is totally a betrayal of what the consumer wants. And whether you write a submission and just send it to Fazans, whether you answer their questions, just send an email, we've got to make it clear civil society and we're not even just talking about new zealand but globally we've got to say regulation of a really powerful technology has to be in place we have to have traceability and labeling the users must be held liable for problems the the the, the authorities must oversee the safety and not presume it to be there it is a challenge to nature it is a challenge to people's well-being and the right to manage their health Fazans are supposed to look after health, but by ignoring and denying people the right to choose, they're saying that we're going to make that decision for all of the public. You will not have a choice to avoid these products, and that's fundamentally wrong. What Fazans are proposing is that gene editing um, through what they call new breeding techniques, what are called uh, precision breeding in the UK, won't be called and considered as genetic engineering or genetic modification because the techniques are a little bit more uh, precise in their targeting of the gene changes and essentially to hide it from the public because they believe that there's so, so little difference between natural, conventional and organic food and these new breeding techniques that the public shouldn't be allowed to choose. What worries me about the P1055 consultation is that if you look at the at the words that are being used by Food Standards Australia New Zealand for SANS, you know, it's the new code definition for GM food is necessary to ensure regulation keeps pace with new techniques. So we can see from our discussion here that there are many queries about uh, whether those techniques are as precise because you can get off target and unintended effects. For SANS on their front page claims this is low, low risk and so a pre-market safety assessment by For SANS is not needed. And such food therefore should not be GM food for code purposes. So they're, they're using the old substantial equivalence thing to say that it's a single outcomes-based definition. And the outcome is that, is there novel DNA in the genome instead of foreign DNA? So they're sort of saying whatever's not there that we can't find. What is, what is the problem with this, John? Well, one of the problems is they're leaving the companies to, 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 to check their own products rather than being um, assessing them through the Fazan's um, process. And, and again, it's not a perfect process. There's lots of exemptions for what they've been doing in terms of regulation and labelling of GMOs. But it, there was kind of a, a, an agreement that, that with the public that they would have a right to choose and there would be a pre-market assessment. What they're doing with this paradigm change is to say, no, there won't be. Now, that's a real opening up of vulnerabilities to the food system, to people's rights to choose, and also the future of, of food.
And just going back to what's being excluded, we were talking about the revised definitions for so-called novel DNA, if it's novel and it's not there, you know, a novel protein's not there, but it's, there's also definitions for food derived from null segregant organisms, grafted plants, um, substances regulated by other standards in the code. This is food add add additives, processing aids, nutritive substances, and then an explicit exemption for substances used in cell culture to support the growth and viability of cells and to process cells for the production of cell cultured food. So if we think about America, only there's only 11 GMO crops that are really widely used in 11 in, in, in America. So um, Elvira, what this feels like, this is deregulating a heck of a lot of uh, GMO products that will be in our processed food, our stable long shelf life food that, that people won't be able to tell. The agreement has been that a case by case assessment of each event, because each event is unique, mm. would happen to make sure it's safe and that there'll be labelling. And this, this this proposal, P1055, Rifazan's deadline, 10th of September, is that no, there won't be. Now, that the, 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 not to assess what you have done, what may have happened accidentally, and to leave it to the companies to decide that it's safe and therefore market it, as I say, is, is, is giving the fox command of the chicken house but what the fazans are saying and, and i'd love to hear elvira's view on this is that because these products are now not being deemed gmos they're not going to be labeled because they're so uh, they could produce a product that is possibly produced naturally um they're not going to regulate it because it's so much like nature they can't track it and trace it and because, which is a big problem, because of course, if it's driven by patents, the companies will want to track it and trace it. Yeah. So one of the responses to this decision to not process base the, um, the regulation, in other words, ignore the process that's gone on and just look at the end product. As you mentioned earlier, the end product analysis is very light and, and, and on, on detail because it says, oh, look, this artificial lab-grown chicken happens to have about 20% protein and it's got some you know, iron in and it's got some other things in it. So this lab-grown food is really similar in some of these dimensions to what normal chicken would be like. So, oh, look, it is normal chicken. No, it's not because these other things could have happened. I have almost 40 years clinical experience working as a naturopath. I have, uh, and that's uh, given me a unique opportunity to be able to uh, research um, clinical products, so research information in the medical arena. Why are these new breeding technique foods going to be released into the market for humans' consumptions when even scientists and government um, can't agree on how they should be labelled and tested? You know, there's there's so much that is still needing to be addressed and addressed very seriously. Surely we need to avoid releasing any consumable products that have been conveniently deregulated simply by defining it out of regulations. Can these uh, companies and organisations be trusted now to work in favour of human health or are they more oriented towards profit margins for those funding the new breeding technique, GM products? And how can the process of testing the long-term effects of these uh, products be trusted to the companies who benefit from them um, when this is so contentious? And what guarantees can be given to ensure that these new engineered genetic materials won't escape into the wider environment during testing or even after testing, uh, as has occurred in the, even the most um, secure laboratory facilities? It's just too uncertain. Everything is too uncertain. I mean, when you have a product changing in nature to produce genetic diversity, usually that change is in response to environmental stresses. Okay. And over a period of a few generations, the organisms that modify naturally so that they cope with those external stresses are the ones who then go on to survival of the fittest 
okay? But when that process is accelerated over a very, very short period of time, it's conducted in a laboratory by scientists who aren't looking beyond a narrow range of potential side effects, then you're going to run into big problems because you're going to have, okay, we're only going to test what, um, what ways this genetic uh, genetic modification is working. We're not going to check for the sister reactions. We're not going to check for the second line of reactions and the third line and the fourth line. We're only going to focus in on this one singular targeted um, sequence change that we're manipulating. And nature doesn't work like that. First things first, how is food defined legally in Australia? Okay, I have a, a master's degree, a master of science in nutritional epidemiology and public health. And I'm also a, a certified practicing nutritionist. So my degree before that was um, nutritional medicine, uh, advanced diploma. And before that, I did a, a business of bachelor administration. So my first career was sort of in business, international business. And then I pretty much 20 years ago, I pivoted into the health field. So this is from the latest, the current Food Act. Meaning of food. Food includes A, any substance or thing of a kind used capable of being used or represented as being for use for human consumption, whether it is live, raw, prepared or partially prepared. Even in that, you could, you could already say that, okay, so the definition of food includes things that are not food. They can just be marketed or promoted as food. What would so, be an example that comes up for that? Well, I mean, I'm thinking of it from a, you know, a natural and health perspective. So I'm thinking ultra processed foods where you've stripped um you 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 could have stripped um most of the ingredients the beneficial ingredients for health out of the uh, out of the raw ingredients whether it's wheat or rice or so you've completely stripped out a lot of the beneficial nutrients and you're left with something that you call wheat but there's really only you know sort of one nutritional aspect to it which is the carbohydrate aspect and the energy aspect um and that and you mix that with colors and flavors and you call you know if you look at cereals um it's it's more a food-like product rather than a real food the way that i look at it from a <laughs> from a more natural health perspective. Then B, any substance or thing of a kind used capable of being used or represented as an ingredient or additive in a substance or thing referred to in paragraph A. So that comes, you know, that's all the colors, the flavoring, all the additives. So, you know, obviously there's products that are of chemical engineering. There's, you know, natural flavors, um, the result of ultra processing. I mean, you know, there's really weird stuff, crushed up insects that are being used in, in colouring, the, the glands of a beaver that are being used in, you know, the flavouring, raspberry flavour, I think it is. So there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in, in that category that's in our full food already. What do you think is any substance used in preparing a substance or thing? For instance, I mean, I, I would think of how oils are being prepared for consumption. So seed oils, they're using chemical extraction processes and solvents and um, bleaches and those type of things to extract the actual seed oil for consumption. So it's a refinery process. It could be the medium that the lab meets being cell lines being cultivated in. But yeah, is that a food? Declaration of what is food after consulting the authority, so the authority is defined as Food Standards Australia New Zealand. They are the authority. The minister may, by legislative instrument, declare that a substance or thing is food for the purposes of this act. Fasans is the ultimate authority on this. They are the regulator, but they also define what they are regulating. The way that I see these things are being constructed, constructed is that they use a, a very wide definition of what food is. Pretty much everything could be constructed, as it says. You know, it can be represented. Pretty much it covers everything. And then they use a very narrow definition of 
safety. And that definition of safety is, you know, as we said, apply to, at, you know, the so food doesn't spoil, uh, doesn't spoil at the point of sale, over time, people don't get poisoned, uh, there's no glass in, you know, it's all hygiene practices. So it's very narrowly defined safety. In none of the considerations is the impact of the food on human health. It is very clear evidence, you know, these are government reports that show that, you know, the public health system in Australia spends over $5 billion per annum dealing with food-related, um, you know, diseases, plus the population itself is affected, you know, to the effect of over $24 billion per annum when it comes to just the suffering and the loss of productivity um, you know, within the community. So it's massively expensive, but none of that is considered within these proposals because it's it's not part of the act. To me, this is all a big definitions game because if you can control the definition, it creates loopholes, which gives a massive space of uncovered territory in terms of introducing foods and never having to justify the safety aspects, for instance, that relate to human health in the medium and long term. When I saw the proposal for the de changing the definition of GM foods, what I'm seeing there, again, from a sort of generalist perspective, is that, okay, we have GM foods, We've got this potential that it can create confusion because we want to introduce all this new stuff in the marketplace. We want to look for ways to commercialize things faster and make money faster. Therefore, we want to have less confusion. And the best way to do that is by narrowing the definition of what GM foods means. So we build a nice little container for that definition. It's very small and restricted. It basically only contains all those things and things that we already know. And we have safety processes for in place because we already do that. And we have clear labeling requirements for that in place. So just that whole intention of changing definition, really what it does, it puts the, um, the work for SANS need to do into a nice contained little box, whereas everything else becomes open field for industry to just go and do whatever. They made it clear in the webinar and they make it clear in the documents. This is going to be a lot of genetically edited foods going to fall under this non-GMO. Exactly. Label. So I don't know how a proposal like this is going to be stopped unless the actual Food Act is going to be opened up for discussion and looked at at a national level and at a political level. And it takes some guts, I think, political guts to actually say, hey, hang on a second, we need to look at this because we can no longer move forward in this direction without considering human health. So you are at the coalface and you're seeing the effects of more synthetic food on the on people as well as more processed food on the people, which is what we're looking at with this mm deregulation what are you seeing in terms of you know you've been working for 40 years what have mm. you seen during that 40 years with as people's diets have changed physically we are morphing into people who are overweight who expect to have health problems who uh, accept that it's an inevitability uh, who accept that aging brings with it health issues that weren't necessarily assumed in days gone by, we are accepting that fast foods and convenience foods, mass produced foods are just a way of the world now. Now we're paying a price for that because we're seeing more and more health issues arising in younger and younger people. And that's my concern. And the big questions aren't being asked. What are the big questions as to why? The big questions are what's driving it? What's the relationship between the new uh, fast food, um, process, highly processed food uh, industry and the, this, this notable decline in people's general health at an earlier age? So much vested interest in mass-produced foods, in so-called convenience foods, in foods that have been designed to have maximal, maximum uh, palatability 
um, by the addition of ingredients, high fat, high salt, high sugar, high flavor enhancing esters. It, you know, there's a whole range of additives that are put into foods now. And these foods are then tested by panels to determine what's the greatest palatability, not what's the greatest health benefit, but what's the greatest palatability and therefore addictiveness to the consumer. And this for Zan's new proposal will be that additives are not um, genetically engineered additives will not be listed as a genetically engineered on packets. So we're also going to have the genetically engineered food within this or the additives within this proposal. Is genetically edited food really the same as organic natural food? It's, it's got nothing to do with long-term health. It's not mentioned um, and what the health effects could be. It's just that these genetically engineered foods are now seen as the same as conventional foods based on characteristics. But what characteristics are they looking for? Are they only, you know, is it the same as the lab meat where they just assess vitamins and nutrients which are synthetically put in compared to the real quail, so the lab quail, yeah. The real quail, oh, we've got the same characteristics because it's synthetic, vitamins and minerals, yep, tick, it's the same thing. Which it absolutely isn't. So a food that ha has been grown or, or bred uh, as nature intended is going to have a very different impact and a, a much more predictable impact on the human body than food that's been interfered with any in any other way. We start from that platform. And as a holistic health practitioner, I look to draw people back to a basic diet, a whole foods diet, from which they can deviate from time to time. But the platform of them looking for optimal good health is a whole foods diet, preferably organic. These foods, these new synthetic foods can even be labelled as organic because theoretically they don't have any chemicals involved in their production. So food that we could once trust organic food now we can't trust we're in this we're in shifting sands you know we we just we don't know where to step we don't know where the holes are and also if they take away regulation on these on these products for the convenience of the food industry then we have no way of assessing anything safely. Uh, so they're basically saying these, you know, these, these gene technologies, we're, we're deeming it low risk because we are comparing conventional foods with these novel breeding technique foods. And because we don't see the risk with conventional foods, we can't see why there would be any risk with the new breeding technique foods because at the end of the day, we're just looking at the outcome characteristics and they're pretty much the same. So nothing to worry about. So in the actual document, so I went into that document to actually see, well, what is the substance behind this? And where is the scientific evidence that really shows the comparison between conventional foods and these new breeding technique foods? Yeah, so the analysis of that comparison it talks about safety, but then again, safety is also um, defined very narrowly. Um, safety is looked at within the scope of Fazans, which is, very, if you look at it, it's very much about food at the point of sale, you know, that it's not spoiled, it's not going to poison anyone, uh, it's not going to cause problems, there's not going to be foreign objects mixed into food. So, it is very much actually focused on the food itself, whether the food is safe, you know, free from these things and there's no contamination. So all of the safety analysis is around that point, but it actually does not even talk about safety for human health. So these so are the characteristics you found the studies they rely on for the character when they say this GM food will have the same characteristics as conventional food. Are you talking about that? Well, when I'm looking at the safety analysis, so when they actually, I had to go back and say, well, how do they actually define safety? What are they looking at? So it's a false equivalence. So the statement itself is a false equivalence. So a false equivalence is, is when you say, oh, an apple is a fruit, an orange is a fruit. They both come from a tree and therefore an apple is the same as an orange. I wrote down some of what she was saying, Lisa Kelly, about this. So um, someone must have said, what's the pr process to show low risk? 
you know, and that they've got the same characteristics, something, there must have been a question generally around that. And she says the basis for their, their findings is what you've said, that this genetically edited food is the same as conventional food, therefore doesn't need any safety testing or um, labelling because conventional food is safe, so therefore this genetically edited food is safe. That's the sort of way they were talking. The base, She said the basis is really focused on characteristics. What we yep. know with the genome editing tech, there are similar sorts of changes to the genome as conventional agriculture or conventional farming and has the same outcome. The outcomes determine safety, not the process itself. This is why it's outcome-based. If the food is equivalent, therefore, it has the same risk. Conventional food is low risk, therefore, crispered food is low risk. We're not saying, this is her, we're not saying they're identical. The characteristics are not identical, but it's an acceptable range for safety. Yeah, but in that, they only look at the safety of the food. They do not even consider the implications of the effect of these foods on human health. Right. So that is really just a major part that is just omitted in this entirety. So Let's explore some of the new breeding techniques, the MBTs, starting with null segregants. Here are excerpts from a longer interview between Jody Brunning from Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility and Professor Jack Heinemann. Jack, you're the, set, you're the director of the Centre for Integrated Research in Biosafety at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. And your latest paper is the result of a collaboration between University of Canterbury um, researchers and um, its colleagues from the Climate and Environment Dis Division, Norse, I think, the Norwegian Research Centre. Can you please explain what a null segregate, segregant is and briefly outline this paper? Sure. Uh, a null segregant, and, and, and in some places they're called negative segregants, is something to which DNA has been added, and that added DNA has been removed. So they're the Schrodinger's cat of biotechnology. They're both a GMO and not a GMO at the very same time. And that's a conundrum. So if you believe that genetic engineering can only be a process in which DNA is added to an organism. If you believe that, and, and, and I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that that's what a GMO is. But if you were to believe that, well then it becomes, that organism becomes rehabilitated, remade, reborn uh, as something that isn't a GMO by the loss of the DNA. And you've also, pointed out that deregulation of the intended null segregants may de facto deregulate the organisms, e.g. Um, bacteria, fungi and invertebrates exposed to the technology along the way of developing the intended null segregants. Can you flesh that out a little bit, please? Yes. So if I do these, use these techniques in a laboratory, and I was saying this earlier, my laboratory is sterile. Only the intended organism is exposed to my techniques. And then even among the many replicates of that organism that I look for candidates that I want to keep, everyone else is disposed of. Everyone else is killed. So only what I intended to make or intended to save from the process is retained. The techniques have gotten to the point, though, where their efficiency is so high, I don't need to do them in a laboratory. Well. In fact, during the pandemic, researchers in the US were both developing and then sending out to school children the kits to do genome editing in their kitchens. So what that meant was you had people who were not trained in laboratory uh, work to protect themselves, others, or to maintain a sterile environment doing it where people eat and exposing all sorts of microorganisms, including the potential fecal coliforms on their hands, um, the streptococci that, are, that inhabit their noses, the, um, the yeast that are growing under their fingernails. All of these organisms were being exposed to these reagents at the very same time as the organism intended to be exposed, which was part of the kit and to a range of people 
from young children to their parents who may have been in that same lockdown household. Now that's just an example of how these techniques have become of the efficiency that you can do it in a kitchen and you can see an intended result, but you still are not able to eliminate unintended results, not only in the target organism, but in all the other things that are exposed at the same time um, that you don't any longer control. So that is exactly the point of an efficiency increase. And I wanna make something clear to my colleagues who sometimes misunderstand this pace argument. They confuse the idea that these techniques have become more powerful because of their efficiency with them delivering a benefit to society. That is not the same thing. So they increase the efficiency at which I get the change I intended to make, but still, how often one of those organisms is a benefit to society comes down to how smart I am. And for the most part, we guess very badly. And I say we, I mean the science and technology community. We rarely make a GMO that actually makes a difference when it's commercialized. And we never make a GMO that doesn't have some trade-off once it's commercialized. So the techniques don't bring benefits faster. The techniques bring the intended changes faster, and we are still as inefficient at knowing what we need to change as we ever were. Now let's look at precision technologies. Precision, I think, is a manufactured word for the community, the biotechnology community. It's long been used to try to placate concerns that the unexpected will emerge from the process of making a genetically engineered organism. The unexpected can emerge. No matter how sophisticated our techniques become, there are still things we can't anticipate. And in fact, we're learning what we can't anticipate as we work on uh, the development of the techniques themselves. But this, is, this shouldn't come as a surprise, but it is a, it is a term that for which uh, there are other words that would be less emotive for the purposes of manipulating the public uh, that they could have chosen to use if the intention were not to manipulate. What, the new, what each of the techniques allows is for the intended outcome to be achieved easier, which is a scale issue. If it can be done easier, you can make more of them, or you can make the same number faster. So it is an efficiency. Those types of techniques make it possible to achieve the intended outcome with greater efficiency. And that's entirely an industrial concept. It's a monetary concept because it constrains the dimensions of cost, time, materials, whatever it might be. The techniques increasingly become independent of a laboratory because inefficient techniques are give you what you want, but it's harder and fewer of the times you do it. Do you achieve what you want? You need a laboratory to keep out all of the contamination that would obscure that result. We think of laboratories as keeping the world safe. Laboratories weren't invented to keep the world safe. Laboratories were invented to make our technologies occur with greater reliability, the outcome occur with greater reliability. And a secondary property of them is that they contain anything we make that might be harmful. The more efficient our techniques become, the less dependent we are on the infrastructure of a laboratory to get what we intended to get. That efficiency is not the same thing as what most people would think of as precision. So precision is substituted for the concept of efficiency to say that we also decrease the number of things we didn't want to get. And there's no evidence for that. So we always get unintended side reactions in any biochemistry in a gene technology technique. So the more often we use that technique, 
the more unintended effects we create. Can you provide if, an example? If I were to genetically engineer a plant to be resistant to a herbicide, and I do that in a laboratory, and I use a highly efficient technique, I can isolate a bunch of different possible plants that are my intended outcome. And maybe all of them are my intended outcome, or maybe one in a hundred. That's an efficiency claim. No matter how efficiently I get that, it doesn't tell me how often that technique caused a change somewhere else in the genome. It may have also done that with much greater efficiency <laughs> because of the nature of the biochemical reaction than if I had not used the technology or done a different technique. I might get that one less frequently. So maybe I get that only one in 150 times. However, I don't know which isolate will and won't have that unintended change, if indeed none of them ever would. Because, well, a biochemical reaction occurs over a space of time, and the chances are that there are changes I can't anticipate, and unless I look really hard, may not find. Every time I repeat that process, on the product of a previous process of using my techniques, I increase the chances of yet another unintended effect. And that's precisely what the new techniques allow. The new techniques allow me to make serial changes in the same organism over time, and thus accumulate a legacy of unknown changes. We're at the effect of it. We, we will not have choice because there is no transparency, there is no communication. And I think, I was reading a few things a, a while ago about precision nutrition and sort of this, you know, potential future where because, you know, we might we might have these nanobots that are actually delivered with the food that can do a quick inventory of what our needs are, biological needs in, in terms of nutrients. And then that can go back to industry and tell them to make your own little personal, you know, package or pouch of food that is going to meet your needs. So it's like human cattle, factory farming, but then with humanity. No, it's definitely not the future that, uh, that I want to see for my children and future generations. So I... Genetically modified root systems. Like one of the things they're going to deregulate and allow is root systems that are genetically engineered. So they'll, they'll graft it with something that's not genetically engineered. So say it's an apple tree and the root system's genetically engineered. And then it's the, the tree trunk is and where the branches are and where the fruit grows is not genetically engineered. So that will be considered um, the same as a normal apple tree. So what do you think about this idea that you can just meddle around with one aspect or one part of a plant and it doesn't affect anywhere else? Playing God with nature leads to unexpected uh, consequences, especially given the resilience of organisms in nature and the unpredictability of the, the organism's attempt to create resilience. So you may say, well, we've worked on this part of the root system, that's going to not impact the other parts of the, of the plant in any other than a beneficial manner. But there's so much unexpected outcome that we have no way of assessing. So what, what goes on in the soil is um, is pivotal here. You know, how do the microbes affect this process? How do the, the funguses in the soil affect this process? And there's a whole world of science out there now that's looking at, you know, plant communications and how that happens via funguses in the soil. So what happens to other plants around it? How can we predict that that plant, when it's tested in a laboratory setting, is going to not self-correct in a way that's completely unplanned because of external influences. We need so much more time before we inflict this technology on an unsuspecting public because all of this technology has to be has to be researched over generations of the plant's life and under various conditions outside of a sterile laboratory. 
Fazans is proposing to only focus on the product and no longer on the process. What are the concerns with this model? In the 1970s, when the first regulations of gene technology were, were made, and those first regulations appeared to us to have merged out of the UK in about 1978, the way in which these techniques were used became regulated, and that was now referred to as process-based regulation. The US initially subscribed to that, but diverged in the 80s to what is often now called a product-based. To put in terms of our earlier discussion, the US attempts to regulate hazard and Europe which adopted the UK vision, and then the Cartagena Protocol, which is the international agreement on regulation, went for a process type description. Even that's oversimplified. The US also uses process to inform what products it regulates. And in the European Union and Cartagena-based countries, the product is assessed. So there is product and process in everyone's regulations. But where it matters is in definitions. What becomes regulated is determined by whether or not it is defined as coming through a process or it's defined as a hazard. And the US uses a hazard base. And that hazard base viewpoint has become almost, I wouldn't say almost, has become infectious among genetic scientists who are very much aligned with the idea that if you can make something in the laboratory that could appear spontaneously somewhere on earth at some time in the last 4 billion years, then there is no reason that it should be separated out for risk assessment. And that is conflating risk with hazard. In the same way that I would say, uh, you know, a uranium atom found in the deserts of Australia will emit radiation spontaneously. And that's natural. And the same decay pathway may occur at the heart of a nuclear bomb doesn't mean I deregulate nuclear bombs. It, it, the, if I just look at the hazard, the hazard at the atomic level is, is identical. But certainly the scale at which that hazard exists at the heart of a nuclear bomb that's been detonated is very different than the scale in the Australian desert. And where it detonates will be very different exposure pathways <laughs> than it is in Australia, because it's unlikely that a nuclear bomb will be detonated in the deserts of Australia. Um, if it's detonated, they'll be at the heart of a city where people are. So this whole conflation of naturalness, the idea that uh, something that can occur without human intervention should not be regulated if it does occur by human intervention, is artificial. And it is a fixation on just a small aspect of the risk assessment, the hazard level, rather than risk, which is a combination of the inherent potential to cause harm times it being in the right place and time to cause harm to something that you're trying to not cause harm to. And that's what risk is. So, so many products of... Uh, many GMO products in the future are going to be null segregants. And the reason is that the techniques called genome editing uh, and uh, similar techniques involve putting in a piece of DNA, causing the rate of genetic variation to change, so mutagenesis, the pace of mutagenesis to change. And because they are biased sources of mutagenesis, they occur with high efficiency at the intended location. That doesn't mean they don't occur with low efficiency at unintended locations, but they definitely occur with high efficiency at the intended location. So the rate of change, genetic change, 
is much higher during the time that this new piece of DNA is in the cell of an organism. Once you get the change you want, you lose that extra piece of DNA, but preserve the effects of having caused mutations, amplify the organism to a commercial scale and release it, or you'll do this right in the environment where it's already released because the techniques are that efficient now. All of those things are called null segregants once they lose the piece of DNA. And the idea is that, well, mutations can occur in nature anyway, and we don't regulate the mutations that occur in nature, so we shouldn't regulate those that we create with our technology. But once again, the point is that when we do it, we do it at a scale that doesn't occur in nature or almost never occurs in nature. And then on top of that, we do it in a place and to organisms that, have, that we are exposed to or envi particular environments we want to protect or species we want to protect in those environments. We do it in those places that the same effect in nature would occur extremely rarely, if at all. So we change the scale of exposure, which is the other part of the equation of risk. Null segregants are a big part of that biotechnology imaginary. And that is how we come to understand how a biotechnology works. So can you just, just quickly talk about biotechnology imaginary? Because it sounds a little maybe fluffy to people. Right. Yeah. So... Um, and, and pejorative, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, well, sometimes it is when it comes from me, but, but um, it's not intended to be pejorative. It is how a group understands something. So as a technical expert, I have a biotechnological imaginary about how something works. And other groups may have the same or a very different imaginary about how something works. When it comes to risk then, it becomes really important how we think something works. If we think something works precisely the same in my laboratory as it does in nature, I'll have a different concept of harm, potential for harm, uh, than if I think they uh, work exactly the same way. So the uh, difference being that if I do it in my laboratory, there's very different exposures. So even if there's identity on the molecular level, there won't be identity on the evolutionary or exposure level. And this is an important point. Evolution has two parts to it. So in nature, there's all sorts of ways in which genes change. And the biochemistry of that change may be identical to how I cause change in my laboratory. It could be. And even where it's different, that may not be different in a meaningful way. So that is the source of genetic diversity. But the far more important part, part of evolution is selection. So even if you get variants, what happens in nature is that those variants are fit. They're more fit or less fit than somebody else next to them. And if they're fit enough, fit enough, they remove those who are less fit. And that's called evolution. It's a change in the frequency at which a trait occurs in a species. We become the agents of natural selection when it comes to gene technology. While we might hypothetically have ideas identical inputs as nature into the generation of diversity at the molecular level, what is completely separated from nature is how we select for the outcome. And that is where risk matters, because by selecting, I change the scale, that is the evolution of that individual, uh, because it becomes a population and the frequency of the traits I created change. So that's the important point. And, and many, I think, of my molecular biology colleagues have forgotten that evolution isn't mutation. 
It isn't just creating changes in genes. It is that really important process through which selection changes the frequency of a trait in a population. And we are that agent. And that is what's not ca captured if you only look at hazard. So the lab meat, which you cannot get anything that's probably less natural <laughs> than lab meat. Yeah. And, you know, and I've talked about with vow food and they use a medium that's port pig genes infused into barley. And that's the medium that makes this cell line um, reproduce. That lab meat is not considered genetically modified because there's no novel DNA in the in the lab meat once it's created. So, so what do you think about that? That there's now no sense that how you do your food, how you grow your food, what processes are involved in that, that that's got nothing to do with the outcome of food and the health consequences. Well, of that is that's just playing in the hands uh, of industry because if you look at it, if there was full transparency of these processes and the ingredients and people would know about it, they would say, yuck, this is like gross. Why would anyone eat this? I wouldn't even give this to my dog. I think it is basically just obscuring and it's using, again, these language constructions and definitions to, within the law, get away of doing all of this without being held accountable for it. And they're missing the point that the, the main reason we eat food and why natural food is so healthy is because it is infused with light and photonic energy. So it's the plants that do photosynthesis, they capture the light, they translate it into energy, and it's that photonic energy that is not even measured or looked at as a nutrient at this stage that is part of our health. I think that's a big part that explains why diets like the Mediterranean diet are so good for health. It's not just the, the, the fibers and the package of the, of the macronutrients, micronutrients, um, you know, enzymes, bacteria. It is actually the life force within the food that is a big determinant for health outcomes. Are genetically modified foods really safe? Well, what we're really talking about today is gene technology, the ability to specifically intervene in the molecular structure of what we think of as a gene, and to do that at will and to our own specifications. We think, or I think, technology is that means to do something that otherwise we would have to wait to happen spontaneously. So a technology is what gives us the ability to do something at pace or at will or at a particular size. The vast majority of technologies increase output, but also increase the potential for harm. And that's why we have risk assessment. And that risk assessment takes into account the fact that something is a hazard. An automobile is a hazard. A GMO is a hazard. But whether it causes harm is the complex equation of its potential to be to cause harm times it being in the place where it can cause harm. And that place isn't just its location, its place is, does it have enough of it to cause a harm? Uh, is it being uh, in, in the range of those who are susceptible to harm? So um, a, uh, a, a type of hazard that might be very important for children, but unimportant for adults, is the risk of that is low if it's never found in a place with children. And its risk is high if it is found in a place with children. So its risk is not the same thing as it being a hazard. They're allowing something hugely into the market. It's just a big open door and with no longitudinal testing, meaning that, and there's no accountability. And that's it. That's a big one too. Yeah. Without regulation, there is no accountability. Without regulation and um, the requirement for independent testing, not industry, not in-house testing, in a laboratory, 
for independent testing, both in a lab and in the field, um, over generations of that product without the uh, responsibility to conduct that sort of testing, then we're we're out at sea without a without a boat. You know, we we are really in deep water as consumers. No idea. We have no idea in the future. They won't have any idea about certain cancers cropping up. You know, inflammatory. Oh conditions and and how that could at all be related to the new foods coming onto the market there will be no way of having any sort of assessment um process for that what do you what's your sense about children so a lot of adults may go walk around you know and not eat food that's nutritionally rich and close to nature but most people care about their children and what mm. do you see? So even just the development of a baby and, you know, I know that you focus a lot on gut health and, you know, the mm. importance of that. Do you see any correlations or concerns with this genetically engineered food? That's a really good question because what are children? Children are rapidly growing and developing cellular, cellular organisms. So to test in an adult where their growth is um uh, you know basic their basic growth is, it's always still happening at a cellular level but their basic growth has has completed to compare that with what's going on in in children both preterm in utero and after birth that's where i'm really concerned because that new cellular technology that hasn't been tested longitudinally that can have enormous impacts on that rapidly developing cellular organism and so i think about mothers consuming those foods when they're pregnant what happens then because we cannot guarantee that those foods will just pass through the gastrointestinal tract and then be eliminated only what we require is going and only what's safe for us is going to be absorbed this technology has been around so briefly in terms of our overall evolution that the body cannot determine. We can't leave it to our bodies, bodies in a wisdom to determine what's safe and what's not. So the best thing to do is avoid it. It's to have food that we have developed as a species to tolerate, to benefit from, a, uh, and that's food that occurs in nature, not food that some scientist in a laboratory under sanitised conditions is telling us is nature identical. And what about gut health? So do you see, is gut health like the soil <laughs> health you're talking about? Is it the same? Absolutely. Our gut is one cell. Our gut mucosa is one cell thick, okay? They're very specialised cells. They do an amazing job, but they can be impacted on by a number of things, stress, um, um, chemicals, um, all sorts of agents in our environment, um, as well as uh, the type of food choices that we make. Now, you add another unknown entity into that equation and you could be dropping an atomic bomb on onto our health and we all know the importance i mean i'm very impressed that so many people now are aware of the relationship between gut health and brain health and how our moods and our emotions our capacity to think and reason and make decisions is very much um, involved with how healthy our gut is in that instance we're introducing things these foreign agents from the outside world that haven't been properly tested into our bodies, what impact is that going to have? Because our body will go, oh, okay, here comes X, Y, and Z food product. We'll apply enzymes in the action of enzymes. Uh, we'll break that food down because we've always done that. And then we'll absorb what we consider to be um, important nutrients from that food. Um, and that's how the body operates and will continue to operate because we haven't had the length of time to change that programming. What is going to happen to those foods when even when our gut is interacting with them? What's going to happen? What's the influence of um, our internal environment on um, those engineered foods? 
that hasn't been assessed. It's a little bit like the tree example. What's the effect of the microbes in the soil? What's the effect of other environmental um, chemicals? And uh, what's the effect of the, the funguses and various other organisms? We have no way of assessing that in such a brief period of time. And now they're talking with this gene technology, not only interfering with one or two sequences of genes, but expanding it out. So we're experimenting, science is now moving to experiment with modifying a whole sequence of genes there is no way of knowing how that's going to affect us. As a as a nutri someone who's studied health, humans, yes. what are your concerns about this for human health? Well, my concerns are that already if we look at conventional foods, including ultra-processed foods, since the introduction of these foods, we have seen an explosion in chronic disease. We've got an uh, 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 we've got an, an epidemic of overweight and obesity, which is really the single most biggest health challenge in most Western countries and now also increasingly in third world countries. We have a massive health issue that is potentially entirely preventable because if you look at the determinants of disease and chronic disease, only about 5 to 10% of these chronic diseases can be explained by genetics. Okay, So you can say, well, I've inherited something from the family and that explains my susceptibility to, you know, to cardiovascular disease or to, to particular cancers. So only about 5 to 10%, a massive part, you know, predominantly these chronic health diseases are lifestyle diseases. And in terms of our lifestyle, within lifestyle, the biggest determinant of health and impact on health you can have is your diet, is the food that you eat. And within science, if you look at, well, what are the diets, you know, the lifestyle behaviors that have the highest level of evidence for health, probably the Mediterranean style diet is, is the most referenced and research diet. And that diet is essentially free of process, free from processed foods, you know, from ultra processed foods. It's not just the proteins, it's, it's what can happen when they're cutting from other sort of anti antibiotic resistant genes or other organisms that might be in the way. Well, with this technique, it, it could be any sort of contaminating DNA that shouldn't be in, in the system that is, and then that um, can disrupt or incorporate itself or, or just have an effect on the plant DNA. My question has always been, actually, the problem is not with the genetics. I mean, we all know that epigenetics plays a huge part. The way you grow a plant or the way you farm an animal plays a huge part you know the soil the quality of the feed the ph of the soil the water content the organic matter everything play, plays such a huge part we we are assuming that nature isn't good enough you know hasn't produced the right sort of um construct which is which is really a kind of ignorant of how good nature is and how clever nature is and also how good nature is at repairing things and evolving to a better and better genetic, biochemical, structural organism. There's an aim within a plant or an animal to better itself and to heal itself and to deal with environmental stresses or biochemical stresses. And there's this assumption that the plant doesn't know, so we have to tell it what to do in yeah, but we all know already we have the ideal system with good quality, either heirloom or conventionally bred. And I don't include um, irradiation and chemical mut mutagenesis in there because that is also a problem. But just conventionally selectively bred, we've got these excellent crops and the problem is not they're genetically inferior. The problem may be the way we're growing them and what we're growing them on and what we're doing to them.
it's really important that Fazans really recognize the public demand that they take oversight of these products, do not leave it to the companies and to trace them and label them through the system. Because you can make one genetic change and make another genetic change. And, it, and if it's not being regulated and overseen, there's two things. One, the gene pool of an animal or a plant is progressively changed over time, quite rapidly because it's so efficient and effective. And no one's really monitoring what that gene pool looks like anymore. The second thing is that the risks that are being basically termed as negligible by Fazans and industry is based on a kind of don't look, don't find kind of approach. You were just saying, John, that they tell us it's OK, therefore it's OK. And therein lies the problem because they don't actually know it's OK. They just say we say it's OK, therefore it is. What are the effects of genetic editing on animals and the environment? If you Google mutant cows die, you will find the New Zealand Herald's report of a trial in New Zealand, which was a really bad look for New Zealand exports and branding, not good for the animals. And it's a warning that if you allow gene editing in animals, for example, to double their muscle growth, um, as, I mean, technically, I think that can be done through a gene editing process, not introducing foreign DNA, but just changing the animal's DNA. It, double muscle growth is not a good thing for animals. It might be great for marketing and chopping them up and selling them because you've got more meat. But we've got to be really aware that it's not just plants that are in the firing line for deregulation of gene editing, animals too. And it could be extremely cruel. And without a bioethics council and with a kind of slightly, you know, internally assessed, you know, uh, ethics councils in, 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 the cry, in the Crown Research Institutes, you're really not going to have that protection on animals. Regulation works at scale transitions. So where harm can accumulate at scale transitions, that's precisely where regulation is a solution to mitigate risk. If we go from the laboratory to outside, that's a scale change. In the laboratory, I had a sterile environment where I knew that only my plant was exposed to my tools. If I now do that same process, which the new techniques allow me to, if I do that same process outside of a laboratory, say in the field itself, there are billions of organisms exposed simultaneously. All the microorganisms in the soil, all the microorganisms on the plants and in the air. There are animals, invertebrates, mammals that are running through these fields, birds. All of those things are simultaneously exposed and have the potential to react in that same to that same biochemistry. And every one of those changes is unintended because they're not even my target organism. So at that scale change, regulation would really matter. If we were to say the technique itself is, an inher is inherently safe and therefore no product has to be regulated, then I can use those techniques outside in the field. By deregulating the hazard, which is the organism I intend to change. Unless you have commensurate regulations on the process, you deregulate when and how people use these techniques. They can use them anywhere. They can use them in schoolyards. They can use them in the center of the city. They can use them in their garage. So we have to think in that trajectory of the technology, not in the end point of the technology, to understand why regulation is an important assurance for society that the biotechnology biotechno product, not just the technology product is safe, but that it didn't create a hazard in its making. What effect will Fazan's proposal have on consumer trust? How can covert, unlabeled introduction of poorly tested food ingredients be seen to be engendering consumer confidence? because the engendering of consumer confidence is something that Fazant's supposedly takes quite seriously. If the consumers aren't confident in the products they're, they're um, being exposed to, um, you know, what's behind that? How can we support that confidence being developed? The market for non-GMO food 
is projected to grow at 11.9% every year for the next 10 years. And this is like official marketing you know, evaluators in India, in China, in America. So there's a huge demand growing. I mean, it's not a lot of markets that are growing at you know, 12% a year, year on year for the next 10 years. And, and so certainly we must not lose food. that. So, so just gen generic conventional foods normally got a CAGR of a seven or eight percent, whereas this is this is twelve percent. So it's substantial. The um, I mean, I hope that, that's the, that's one of the main points that we, we've got a marketing opportunity. It was very interesting that the biotechnology industry have said that they don't care about the marketing issues on our brand image because they don't think it's an issue. But it is an issue because unless you put the consumer at the heart of your endeavor, you're going to go off field, and, and that's really what's happening. Yeah. But the marketplace in New Zealand has, has ended up because there is labelling and there was that choice, which everybody agrees that there should be, well, not everyone, but most consumers agree, whether they like whether they like GMOs or not, there's a real agreement that there should be transparency and choice. And what's happened in New Zealand is because the market, and that's why it's gone very quiet in New Zealand, it hasn't been quiet in Europe, in America, but all the main manufacturers have avoided using GMOs. It comes in as animal feed, um, but at the moment, we're essentially our mainstream food supply is GM free, except that there could be a little bit of contamination by accident that would still allow be allowed to happen. Um, you know, in terms of sale, um, they wouldn't necessarily have to pull it off the shelf. But because there's an integrity, and, and you know, every food manufacturer and exporter and 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 producer knows that integrity and traceability is the ground on which trust in our products, especially from New Zealand, is you know, is gained globally. Unless you have that integrity and traceability, you, you really are betraying the, the system and the public. The basis of regulation has been trust. And there's actually quite good levels of trust in Fazans until now. Not necessarily well placed, but it's not the worst organisation in the world. And it has navigated so far the option for people to choose in the supermarkets by labelling GMOs. What they're proposing is the ultimate betrayal of that agreement. So I, I worry that I, I definitely want people to make a submission to Fazans. I completely worry that they'll continue to ignore them because just as they believe that there's nothing to see here in terms of changes in the genome that need regulation, they're also saying they don't want to hear from the public. They've, what they've said is labelling is out of scope. Now, they said that you know they, they've made that decision before they asked the public knowing the public want this traced and labeled so there's a real conflict between what's coming out of industry and fazans deadline the 10th of september and what the market wants up until now fazans and and agencies like that were operating on a basis of general trust that we could trust that if they were assessing foods and they were then allowing those foods to come to market that therefore those foods weren't terribly dangerous even the health researchers like myself have found a, a distinct correlation between the consumption of foods that have been um, changed in this way even not fully genetically engineered, even just supplemented with flavour enhancers and uh, things to make them more palatable. When you start bringing in technology that, A, hasn't had longitudinal testing, B, where there's no regulation, and C, where um, it's in the interests of big food, the, the big food technology companies, um, to conceal potential side effects. And then we're being told that Pazanz is no longer going to assess those foods, that that testing and the obligation for testing is going to be given to those very companies who are profiting from the production of those foods. Then there's been a betrayal of trust, a complete and utter betrayal of trust. And that's that's a big concern as well. How can we feel safe as consumers, and that's part of what Fazants wants us to do. It wants to have no harm to consumers, trust from consumers regarding the foods that are approved. When that's being let down, we feel very betrayed. Fazans really want to hear from the public. After all, we will be forced to eat genetically edited food if they follow through with their proposal. Shouldn't we have a meaningful voice? 
The demand is for non-GMO food globally. And if we start allowing companies to contaminate and introduce new products without labeling and tracing, we've really betrayed the public demand for the choice. And we've really started to undermine our export reputation and our exports because the studies you mentioned, Jody, are about the consumer attitude. And, 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 in, and even here, there's a lot of confusion. The farmers in the survey said, oh, yeah, we support GMOs. And, and then they were asked, what is a GMO? And they were given some definitions and they're totally confused, except that one thing was really clear. When people see a definition of gene editing, they say, oh, yeah, that's GMOs. So that fact alone should be enough to say, well, look, the public see it as GMOs. Science, actually, strictly speaking, can see that there's some alterations that have been made through technology that has become a social issue that people want to have regulated. I have, a, I have observed in PSTR do many consultations to uh, government initiatives, and often there is not the chance for the public when they respond to say a simple yes or no. So they'll, you'll start trawling through the questions and they'll, they'll send you into a world that doesn't fail to address many of the concerns on the table. The, um, it's really interesting, um, Jody, because you're absolutely right in containing the discussion to answer these questions. And most people, the public, won't have the expertise. When people go on to answer, if you just copy and paste from someone, because we've seen this happen again and again, they'll say you're a special interest group, they'll lump you together and they won't see you as an individual responding. And this is what makes it really hard. They're giving, they're giving people really silly questions like those consultation questions I've read out that are impossible to quantify, but then there's no capacity for you to say, you know, I want to eat whole food and I want choice for whole food and I actually want choice for processed food too. Fazan's held a webinar yesterday, which is only one week out from when the submissions are due. So they've yeah. had the submission process open for six weeks. So one week before they're due, they put on a one hour webinar where they can, they give a short presentation and then they had about probably 40 minutes to answer questions, which could only be put through a chat box. And they didn't get to all the questions. They didn't get to my questions. And we don't know if that video is coming out or not, or, um, you know, if our questions will be answered somewhere else. What was your sense of that webinar? Look, to me, it just looks like a staged event. <laughs> So there's a format presentation. Yes, it, it, it just looked a little bit staged. Um, also, because you're right, not all. First of all, they started answering questions that came in via email. And I thought, well, who are these questions from? You know, what what is that agenda? So I thought, oh, well, there might be just some easy questions that sort of lead into the topic. Um my questions, that was one of the first ones that, you know, that was on the chat that was answered. Uh, it was referred to the senior scientist, Lisa Kelly. And I just thought she just fumbled, you know, with the answers a bit. It was a bit evasive. Um, I think because my question was also not really going into the technical aspects of the proposal, because really i think what i've got a problem with is that this proposal in its entirety is resting on a conclusion that was made by fasans in a safety analysis where they deem it low risk so i think there's a lot of the population that are concerned about gmos and genetically mm. engineered food and they do say with their fasans with their public surveys when they ask questions about novel foods or genetically engineered foods, people don't know what it really means. The new breeding techniques, people don't know about it. So, so instead of actually educating the public about it before you go and put a proposal through, they go and put the proposal through and expect an uneducated public to be able to respond to it, which makes mm. absolutely no sense. If you're at the point when you become aware the public is not up to date with the new technologies, then because that information is suppressed by big media. Well, then, the, yeah, exactly. Well, there's been nothing in the media about this huge mm. proposal to transform our yeah. food systems, nothing in the media at all. If Fazans was transparent and according to its own dictate that it you know, needs to have food safety, it's about food safety and it's about public trust, then at the point when they realise people aren't up to date with the new technologies, they should be stopping everything and doing a, a Australia-wide education program before they open up for submissions. Look, as an educator, I, I come from a, a background of education and as an educator in the past, I know that 
the delivery of education can come in a number of forms and it depends on who's putting that information together in a package and who's interested serving and then how that will be delivered in schools. Should we be able to choose between genetically edited and natural foods? And um, essentially what we need to look at is we need to have clearly labelled on products whether there has been any genetic manipulation at any point in the processing of that food, the production of that food, so that we can choose whether we want to risk whatever outcomes are going to happen in that line of food production. And if not, that we can go and have safe options in choosing other foods. And I think that's a fairly simple process in terms of labelling. Has this food been genetically manipulated at any point in its production? Yes. Okay. That needs to just be put on the label. If a food has had no genetic interference at any point in its production, then that's put on the label too. And they can be two separate systems of labelling, keep it very, very simple. And then moving forward, we, the consumers, can feel safe in what sort of food products we're, we're um, purchasing. Now, let's be really clear. Everybody, wherever they sit on the spectrum of whether they, they support GMOs and genetic engineering because of whatever reason or oppose it, everybody agrees it's a kind of choice thing. As you said, it's about values. It's you know, Some people like free range eggs you know there may not be a, a technical difference between that egg and another egg but they want to know that that, that that's the background in, in terms of the way it's produced so the process of production of a food is really important to people but what Fazanz is saying is we're not going to tell you about the process we're not going to even consider these as GMO foods and most of all I think the most significant thing is we're not going to label them and, and labelling and traceability are key to both the integrity of the food system, so you people know, farmers know what they're growing, consumers know what they're choosing to buy, but it's also a fundamental right that all consumers, as far as I can tell, support. So by Fazan's announcing this change, that there would be no labelling, that there will be no choice, it's a fundamental attack on that basic, kind of um, basically a kind of social agreement, the contract with society for scientists and society to move forward in this. 80% of consumers in all the markets say, look, we've got to have the choice. So that has to be the fundamental message. And it doesn't necessarily have to go via Fazan's alone. It has to be put, we have to put pressure on our MPs because if they want to maintain the social contract, they've got to allow choose choice and they've got to label it and they've got to maintain the non-GMO um, food system integrity. Who really benefits from Fazanz's proposal? These are scientists, they're, they're public officials, they're doing their little bit and they operate within a framework that is clearly defined and it's, you know, it's legalised within this act. But the whole framework supports industry and it does not support public health and the health of our citizens. Look, that was said over and over again in the webinar. So one yeah. of the quotes I've got, from Lisa Kelly again is we don't want to inhibit innovation. The benefits of this are unknown. So the benefits yep. to actually allow a huge amount of genetically edited food into our food sources where we're not aware, their benefits are unknown, but they don't want to over-regulate and impede innovation. And then after she'd said that, the um, crystal, crystal Lemus, General Manager Science and Risk Assessment for Zans piped up with most countries around the world are upgrading definitions so they are fit for purpose. So it was this, well, every other country is doing it. We don't know the benefits, but we need to, you know, keep up with the other countries doing it. What the retailers said in Europe is to maintain the integrity of the food system as non-GMO to meet the consumer demand may increase costs. The patents being applied by the companies on these new GE products may increase costs. So the promise of cheaper food that's going to be healthy for the planet, feed the poor, save the save the climate, all of this needs to be really carefully scrutinized and questioned because the evidence is that actually those are furfies. Thanks for joining us for the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show.
Tony Hunter is the guest for today's episode. Tony Hunter is a global futurist, speaker, and foresight strategy consultant specializing in the future of food. He is a passionate believer that agri-food tech offers massive opportunities to solve the problems of sustainability and feeding the growing global population. Think of these as technology companies that make food. And anything to do with technology, as we know, the old Moore's law about doubling the um, speed of a process or the number of transistors every two years, now apply that to food. And we see it with Impossible and Beyond at the moment. Every six months, they've got a new version, haven't they? They just keep improving and improving and improving. They're not like traditional food companies that go, we have a formula for a soup. It's selling. Nobody change a thing. Let's keep selling that for the next five or 10 years. And if we can get the cost of goods down by 3%, and we can get 3% more sales, we'll all go to Hawaii next year and have our annual conference. I would suggest that either of the Browns from Beyond and Impossible, if they only thought they're gonna get 3% increase, would go home crying. <laughs> they want another two zeros on the end of that, about 300% next year. I think right, that's right. More, in, more what they're looking for. We're playing God, and I think to our enormous de detriment, because it spirals back again when profit is behind everything when patenting and thereby controlling the food chain is behind everything we the consumers are the last consideration in that process and that's been seen in the car industry where there have been known faults with a car but it's still a cost assessment's been done how much would it cost us to pay out for damages as opposed to keep releasing this faulty vehicle with a known problem um, okay, it's cheaper to just pay out the people who obviously have a problem. When big money's involved, ethics seem to fall down the chain. So they sit right at the bottom because the most important aspect seems to be the bottom line. There needs to be something else. You know, I've been talking about the consumer right and there's agreement with the consumer that have a right to choose. There's another thing that is about risk management. And the argument from the authorities and the industry is saying, well, the risks are so small that we're not even going to consider them. I want the insurance industry to be brought into this discussion because the insurance industry are the calculators of risk they know, and they'll fund cover or not. And if these risks are so minuscule, I want companies who are going to be, you know, if Fazans get their way, are going to be allowed to do this without telling people, but maybe patent it and track it on that. They need to be required to disclose ways to identify their product through the system. They need to be held liable if they pollute another crop or pollute another export market. And the insurance industry need to say, look, we can, we'll cover these really small risks that the authorities have identified as non-existent virtually because they don't exist. And, you know, if, if they came in with their professional view to say yeah, we will cover these risks for commercial use of these products, that would be a very much a, a, a good thing because at the moment the risks are being socialized on the public and the environment. If something goes wrong and you know, and, and Fazans has approved it, or in this case, they've said it, they don't even have to approve it because it's okay. There's no really clear liability. It falls to the public and the consumer and the environment. What can really go on under the banner of science? I'm rather you know, interested in the concept of safe and nutritious food. So what is safe and nutritious food? Is, is that, does that fit in the informational networks that sit inside our governments that lead to discussions around what technology is appropriate? Um, and I don't, I don't believe that happens within our governments or within, say, societies such as the Royal Society. And what you also tend to, uh, to get is you get elites and of course elites is a scientific term that that because they have such knowledge in a particular narrow area they then control the paradigm of what moves forward and that's of course a very Coonian problem you end up with a sort of a dogma of what must get done and what can done and this is this seems to be an eternal problem where you know science and and the governing of science is sort of distorted or corrupted you know that does that does that happen do you see that happening broadly or is it just no yeah of course it is and that's what i you know i the elite is what i call the technical expert um so it's emphasis on technical as then i encounter other technical experts who are not necessarily more expert in the tech but don't need and have never needed 
to engage in the social problems in which their tech's embedded and don't necessarily have the skills or the temperament to think about solutions that wouldn't also addict society to an ongoing need for that technical expert. So the inherent conflict of interest is one in which we secure our position in society. You can see in the other in other countries, but you know, the UK, the the legislation and the public consultation has moved really, really quickly. And what I'm seeing, I received the ag newspapers, I live in the country, is I'm seeing that the dominant uh, conversations around the need to move quickly and deregulate. And of course, there's a conversation in New Zealand that is about deregulating to the environment. And this is separate to the P1055 for SANS issue. But what we see in uh, the New Zealand agricultural newspapers, at least 50% of the time, if not 70% of the time, it's the people that are speaking up are from what's called the Crown Research Institute. So this is planted food research, this is ag research, and this is scion. Now, Dr. Elvira Demis, can you under, can you tell us why this is this is distorting what are um, I guess we could say the facts of the matter? And could you talk to me a little bit about precision breeding as well, please? The first part of the question is is really the people that are doing this work are promoting this work. So it's it's a conflict of interest right from the start because they're promoting this work because their funding comes from the fact that this work is happening and their funding comes from the fact that this work is, has, has a, you know, there's a requirement for this work. Should there be no requirement for this work because there's um, there are too many hoops to jump through and there are too many regulations, they're more likely to sort of veer off in another direction. But the problem is, when you train as a genetic engineer, that's it. That's your skills. You don't. You haven't got plant breeding skills. You haven't got other skills. It's a really specific type of training, and unless you retrain, you can't just switch over to another discipline in science. It's not that straightforward at all. So it's like um, someone. It's like a drug company assessing the safety of their drugs. You know what I mean? The same thing. They're not going to say, well, actually, our drugs aren't as safe as we said they were. You know, look at this. They're going to say, yeah, sure, they're great. And, you know, it's exactly the same thing. So when the scientist comes on and says, you know, we're producing these amazing pine trees or Swedes or whatever, they are saying that to promote their line of work and also to ensure that in the next funding round, in the next funding round, they'll still be getting more money because every year, as far as I know, you bid for funding for your research project. So you're no longer just paid a salary for, you know, every year, no matter what you do, you have to do it on a fund, on a project by project basis. This is the problem. And for example, ag research, very clear, their funding's been cut. So they're much more dependent on public private partnerships. And they're also very dependent on royalties payments. So, so when you are studying something and you, you do a research study, you look at associations or you look at causality. So you, you look at, well, how is this going to affect that? Or does that have an impact on that? And then what are the cofactors within this, you know, within this study? So for every study, you pull together the variables that you want to consider in your study to analyze the relationship between these things. Now, what that means is that actually a lot of things are never included in any analysis because life is not clinical. You know, life is not just a list of things that you look at with the exclusion of everything else. And that's why so many studies are flawed because they are not reflecting of actual life. They're just a statistical, hypothetical analysis. It is a fabrication. It's like a an artificial, it's an artifact. So in the artifact, you can only analyze those things that you are consciously choosing to look at. So they talk about CRISPRing and removing aspects of the genetic structure, and then that's fine. But that doesn't mean that it's not affecting off target. And that's exactly over and over again, that it has bigger effects on the whole ecosystem of the plant or the genetic makeup and how it all works together, which you've talked about before. But they're not looking for that. 
No. And it makes me wonder, like, with having this whole new genetically edited food into our food sources and they just made it, like, it's not, as long as it doesn't have this novel DNA in it, then it's not genetically modified is basically the bottom line of this. How do they know it's not got no, novel DNA in it? Like, if no one's testing anymore. Exactly. And up, yeah. like, do it and do it wherever. How, yeah. who, how are they ever going to know that there's not novel DNA popping up somewhere? I don't know. I mean, that's where you need funding for independent research. And I think that is the problem within research at the moment, because a lot of the research is is geared to commercialization. So a lot of the researchers are looking for novel ways to do things. And there's industry involvement to find commercial applications for for the research. So there's almost like, you know, people have blinders on. They don't really want to know about these things because I think for a lot of academics you know if there's an opportunity for them to sort of you know step into this new biotech cool little companies and earn millions because that's you know I think that's the massive carrot that's being held in front of a lot of people is that you stand to make millions when you when you get involved in these type of operations and yeah, and we're really at a stage, I suppose, where in, in science, there's no generalists anymore. You know, people are so specialised, highly specialised in their field. How do, we, how do we make sure people keep the big picture? And, and it's also really concerning because this is just opening up any emerging tech, which they talk about. So it's not even finding out what their technology is now. This is for the future to make it all very seamless and quick. How much of this genetic alteration of food is about food patenting? KPMG in their, in their recent 2024 paper, they're using the trope that they've got to do this for the farmers when the biggest important critical end game here is a patent with royalties. And yeah. if they were doing it for the farmers, they'd be looking at much more, um, you know, be busy agribusiness, much more complex um, outcomes that help farmers for example become become more resilient in drought but they're not they're not interested in that because that's that's it's follow the patent really there's a hybrid seed doing exactly already what the ag research um gm gm ryegrass is supposed to do and again as you mentioned you know it's a monoculture for being proposed of a patented seed that farmers will have to pay a license for well I, my understanding is that in, in dairy nz did studies maybe over 10 years ago, showing mixed forage would reduce methane. But that's not patentable. So there's a real drive for solutions that can be IP'd and ignoring existing solutions, which is really going to be in the interest of farmers and also addressing these kind of major issues. Now, what product safety data is being made available to the public about these ingredients, about these processes. It, it's important that we have access to that so that we can make decisions about whether we are comfortable with that or not. What longitudinal, independent and transparent scientific studies have been conducted to determine safety over time for human consumption? Well, we know, Julie, that the lab meat, the Val lab meat, lab quail that's um, in process to be allowed into the food market through Fazans, we know that we couldn't see their all of their safety testing and their, their how they use their technology because it's under commercial confidential information. So this is an issue that we're going to see more and more of is that we cannot see the processes because it's under a patent and it's protected. Now, does that make you feel safe in consuming those foods if there is no obligation for those food producers to release data that can clearly indicate long-term safety for human consumption? I mean, do you feel comfortable with that? Well, I don't feel comfortable with a synopsis being given by Fazans or the company that's making the product saying, yes, we have ascertained that it's safe. I would prefer to be able to see the data myself. It brings us to the question of what's at the crux of all of this. It's not the well-being of the human population. And I don't care how much they're saying in populations where there's food shortages, where food deprivation is a very real issue that this is important. What is behind this huge push at the moment? And when you look at naturally produced foods and GE foods or GM foods, it's about creating patents. 
It's about profiteering and it's about the well-being of the big companies rather than the consumers. And I don't know that there are men that I would love to have somebody debate that issue with me. Look, it's quite extraordinary that nature and natural environment gives us so much. And, and yet now it's, oh, to do this, we have to do it better and we have to have it genetically engineered and patented. I mean, it's just insane. And I think you can link back and look at the history of different countries where the interventions have happened over time. And it's led to worse conditions like the Green Revolution has led to worse conditions of food supply and people, small farmers having food in their own hands. And that's an, like there's the health aspect but there's also the aspect of who owns the food supply and whose hands it's in and what their interests are what their interests are is always going to be profiteering is always going to be looking at their bottom line their shareholders and addressing that concern way ahead of human safety over time is synthetic food really the answer is synthetic food genuinely sustainable what concerns me as well, Julie, is reading through government documents, the United Nations documents, they are making this assertion that genetically engineered seeds and crops are better for the climate than natural crops. And so where I'm seeing this potentially leading to, if we look at these root systems that have been genetically engineered, and it talks about, you know, huge amounts of land being needed for biomass crops and Bill Gates is going to do that in America, and he's talking about genetically engineered, which would be these genetically engineered root systems. So my concern is, are they going to, over time, make it that if you grow natural products, that they're not climate, they're not good for the climate? And so our capacity to be able to you know, save seeds and grow food, like what happened in Africa, it becomes completely compromised. No, they don't, you know, they're not good for the climate anymore. Do you, have you got similar concerns? I've got absolute concerns, but I keep spiralling back to the same thing. Who profits from this? Technology pushes the status quo. We let technology providers also tell us what our problems are. So often uh, a, a chemical giant chemical corporation will tell us that our problems are weeds and therefore we need a solution which is a herbicide and then it will tell us that the problem is herbicide resistant weeds and therefore we need another herbicide and we will need a gmo plant that we can spray with the herbicide so they define for us what the problem is we may agree and or certain groups may agree um, and then they do, because they also have in mind what a solution is, and because they provide solutions of a certain type, technological ones in which intellectual property can be uh, con controlled, uh, those, those problems are defined in a way that suits their hypothetical and sometimes actual solutions. Governments fall prey to this. They will define a problem in such a way as it allows for somebody to invent a technological solution. And even if that's a hypothetical one, and then governments invest in a research and development grants uh, or others, private sector invests. Uh, in any way, what we've done with technology push is we've monetized promises. Promises can be sold in the same way that widgets can be sold. And in fact, there's probably a really high profit margin for promises and a much lower one for widgets because the vast majority of promises are never realized. But we forget when those promises have gone unfulfilled and the same purveyors of the promises have moved on to other promises, either for the same failed technology or for new ones that will fail in the future. The contrast to that is goal pull. Goal pull, though, is highly susceptible to being misused. And when it is, it results in the same thing as technology push. So the key thing for goal pull is for a society or a decision maker, somebody to identify an authentic problem. To contrast the two, we saw this. Let's say what you think is, that food is going to be scarce. Technology push then leads to all sorts of promises like plants with enhanced photosynthesis. So these plants can be genetically engineered to more efficiently turn 
uh, bio, turn the sun's energy into biomass. So that's a technology push on the problem of food scarcity. If you are a goal pull and you adopt the same problem, you may come to the same fallacy. And that is you need more production of plants. Food scarcity, let's grow more food. But the problem isn't food scarcity. It isn't a problem ultimately that can be solved or necessarily solved by productivity changes. The problem is that not everyone gets enough good food. So it's not food scarcity. It is that everyone is not getting an adequate amount of the right food. When you define the problem that way, then you can ask the question is, if everyone got the right amount of food, do we produce enough for that to happen? Now, the answer turns out to be yes. In fact, we produce enough good food on Earth right now to fill, feed 12 billion people without a problem. <laughs> so the problem isn't one that requires a technology that changes production. The problem is at its root a social problem social justice problem, an economic problem, and in some cases may be in a local situation, a productivity problem. But once it's defined, once you define the authentic problem, you find that your solutions tend to be a broader palette than just one in technological invention or another. But the promises of technologies don't incentivize us to try. So if governments think that there can be a dramatic change in productivity because of a genetically engineered plant that can harvest more solar energy magically without all the other inputs that plants need to grow greater amounts of biomass, if they think that, then they may not undertake the difficult work necessary to change the social conditions that lead to a maldistribution of good food to everyone on Earth. Organic farmers are already doing stuff that allows them to, to maintain animal health, maintain production without some of these negatives. I clearly saw a lot of this material when I was doing my master's degree um, in one of the subjects. It was just peppered with all of this World Economic Forum studies and all of this information about we need to move to these types of food production. It's actually quite far removed from where the thinking was a few decades ago, because I was involved within, you know, with a, within a student union organization or not even, but a student organization, which was very much, um, and this was in the early 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, focusing on this global theme program of, you know, environmental issues and sustainable development. The thinking at that time was very much about thinking global, so having a global mindset when it comes to understanding that we're all connected, we're all, you know, part of this life on this planet, we're really all one big family, thinking global and acting local. And the acting local part was really about well, strengthening local communities to be sovereign, to, you know, to produce their own food, to be independent, and to have this sort of, you know, constellation of local communities that are sort of all know that they're connected and we're all here to protect, you know, health and we're here to protect the world and the environment. And since then, it looks like that whole thinking has been infiltrated what, what year, by industry. What years were those that, that it had that sort of perspective? Uh, well, I was active within that movement um, in the late 80s and early 90s. I've got a book that talks about Agenda 21, the Rio conference, and that yeah. was biotech and technology was going to save the world. And there were a lot of people protesting around that that approach at that yeah. time. But it is definitely embedded and this is all going to be sold under climate change and yeah. these this food is, well, they're already, it's, it is being sold under that, that this yeah. is better, it's better for the climate and it's better, it will create more food, you can make the seeds and the plants need less water. It's very much like that that perspective has ingrained itself. And we're talking about widespread genetically edited and altered food and plants and animals being released into the environment, um, which has enormous concerns as well for what that does for the non 
genetically edited stock that's already there. On a global level, do you feel like it's appropriate that the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization has a partnership with CropLife to transform our food systems? But there's no transparency because it's patented. So we yeah. don't even, we won't we can't even get to the bottom of seeing what's the technology being used and the specifics. So we we are completely as consumers left out in the dark. And one really important thing, going back to United Nations and, you know, I mean, I've just got a book come, came through the Codex Alimentarius Global Food Imperialism, which I have not had the chance to read yet. Um, but the you know, Codex Alimentarius, the WHO and the World Health Organization and the Food and Agricultural Organization oversee this. And there's been issues with this for, you know, decades and decades and decades and what they're doing with food code. But then you've also recently, I mean, you, you just need this as a prime example, CropLife and the Food and Agricultural Organization created a partnership to transform the world's food systems. And CropLife is Bayer Monsanto Syngenta. Um, and they already own, I think it's 75% of crop um, seed stock. And they're the big chemical companies. Yeah. So we're in serious trouble if people trust this without any understanding of who's actually in control around our food sources globally. No, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's, I think we, you know, I hate to, I, I tend to, you know, I try and sort of be calm about things and say, okay, well, let's look at this and look at the positives and what can we do and how can you be more aware and how can you be educated? And I always focus on, you know, educating my clients in practice and, and, of course, doing that at home with my family as well. But I think there's a massive threat now that all of that effort is, is just going to be meaningless because it just creates, you know, this, this opens the door to so much power and control in the hands of industry Let's just round off now with some of the main concerns raised. I'm looking at who is going to be responsible for negative outcomes, who is going to be testing for these negative outcomes, and how is that testing going to be conducted? And again, who benefits most? And, and where are the interests of physants and agencies like them? Where are they going to be most influenced? by our consumer well-being or by the interests of big big tech, big company, big food production. At my core, I believe that if we're, there's even one concern, we can't release this into, into the food chain. We can't release it onto an unsuspecting public. Given the multiplicity of concerns that are increasing all the time, I think, who is allowing this to happen? Who are these people? And are they beholden to any other larger interests? Absolutely. And if we do the, that three-pronged approach, we have to put a pause on this and say, well, look, you can all go away, develop your, develop your technologies, do all of that sort of stuff, but until we've resolved these core issues, then it can't be released into the public. Number one is the public's informed in an unbiased way. The second one is to very much understand who's going to, who are the, who are the main funders, where's this come from, um, and who are the beneficiaries of that. And Third one is who is assessing uh, the integrity of the, both the agencies involved in the production of this food and where conflict of interest is occurring. And who who is, is there any conflict of interest in people who are, say, sitting uh, on, on boards and who are assessing um, these submissions in Fazant's labelling? Keep labelling very simple and let us make our choices. And if we keep that simple, um, it's about transparency. Complete transparency and accountability. Yeah. What we're saying here is we're saying that people demand the right to know that food is gene edited, that NBT, new breeding technologies, are the same as, as genetically modified gene edited food. And we, we know the evidence is very clear that there can be unexpected changes. So the functional outcome can be unexpected and off-targeted organisms can be impacted. And what we need is we need gene-edited plants and animals to be traced in the food system to protect the health and safety of people in the environment. 
And we believe that the insurance industry must cover the risks of gene editing because who pays when food crops are contaminated or New Zealand loses exports to international markets that maybe are a little bit more rigorous than us in their expectations? Because there's so much complexity and you can you can look for all these little, you know, battlefronts of, of well, what am I going to argue about? But I think it's just really about two potential futures. There's one potential future that is going to be this biotech engineering. It's like creating, it's like humans in control. So it's it's artificial intelligence driven uh, synthetic biology. It's the patenting of the entire biological world. So dominated by humanity, it's a control system that will uh, that will basically deliver to you the precision nutrition that you need and you won't get any more because you know we need to go back to healthy statistics so that's going to be one way of addressing the health problems potentially as well but it's in full control and yes it's like being human cattle and then the other avenue is where we where we basically say we've got to go back into harmony with biological life we are human beings. We are not separate from this planet. We're not separate from, you know, the life on this planet. We are just part of the ecosystem. So let's actually take out all these artificial contract, constructs. Let's start taking out all of these additives because, you know, maybe one single additive has been scientifically proven not to have a, a, a negative health effect, but, you know, combine it with all these other lovely compounds floating around and then there is an effect. But who studies that? Very much this deregulation is hiding a, a huge long tail of problems for ethics, for consumer choice, for animal welfare, for the integrity of the food system, for our exports um, and for our economy. And we've got to find the middle path which puts the responsibility and lives up to people's expectations. These will be regulated. What can we do? Well, put in a submission in your own words to Fazan saying no. Details can be found on my Substack. Link will be in the descriptor to this video. I will also put up a list of gene ethics groups in New Zealand and Australia on my Substack. So stay connected and aware as this progresses. I'm a